Just think about his presence in your life. The difference his presence makes. If you think it's hard, imagine how much harder it would be if you didn't have him in your life. When you see all the things that life can throw at you and all the problems and situations and difficulties and the warfare and the demonic and diabolical influences that try to impact your very being, something on the inside of you ought to make you declare that I'm desperate for you. I'm lost without you. I don't know what I'd do without you. I'm confused without you. I'm baffled without you. I'm bewildered without you. I'm frustrated and disappointed without you. I would lose my very mind if it were not for you. Everything that I have, you gave it to me, God. I'm desperate for you. I'm I'm in search of you as the deer panteth for the water. So does my soul long for thee. Come on, let's just declare that. Put it in the atmosphere. That I... Come on, everybody, sing to him. I'm desperate for you. Come on, you got to make it real personal. Say, I... Tell him I'm lost without you. I'd be like a ship without a sail tossing to and fro. But I want to let you know, God, that I desperate. One last time, put it in the atmosphere. Tell him I Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Mm -hmm. I can't speak for nobody else. But I'm desperate for your presence. It's in him I live, I move, and I have my being. So I'm, oh, I'm lost. Come on, let's raise the roof one last time. Hey, I Come on, raise your voice. I'm desperate for you. Can't live without you. Can't breathe without you. And I'm, oh, I'm lost without you. This is it. We going home. Hey, I, I'm desperate for you. Come on, every true worshiper, be honest with God and tell him, I am. I'm lost without you. I want you to do me a favor. I just want you to hug somebody and tell them that's my testimony right there. That's the story of my life. If it had not been 
for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't be here right now. I'd be stranded somewhere. Oh, I want to invite us now to participate in the Holy Communion. We believe in doing it early on in our worship experience because we want to invite God to commune with us and be with us for the duration of the entire atmosphere. We don't just want to leave out with God, but we want to do everything with him and invite him to just sort of dwell with us in a more tangible way. Jesus said that as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me, of the sacrifice that he's made going to Calvary, dying for our sins, but rising again on the third day morning with all power in his hand. So you should never take communion just thinking about a piece of cracker and some juice. It's deeper than that. The bread represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The wine represents the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for the remission of sins. And I think the old church saying it best, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And then they said, oh, precious is that flow that makes me whiter than snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Bible says he took the bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, this is my body, take ye now and eat all of it. And likewise, the cup, he blessed it, said, this is my blood, take ye now and drink all of it. And as he is, so are we in this world. And everybody said, amen. God bless you today. Anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time? God bless your heart. We are so thankful and grateful that you're here celebrating with us on today. To all who are visiting with us, we are so glad to have you. So grateful that you're here. A lot of people are having church services right now, uh, and the fact that you came out here uh, to visit us on Highway 150 in Hoover, Alabama, we're so glad that you're here celebrating with us on today. Let me see the hands of all of our visitors. You're not a member here at FCC. You're just visiting with us. Let me just see you wave your hand in the air. Hey Amen. Let's give it up for all of our visitors today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So glad you're here with us, and we pray that your stay with us would be an exciting one, an exhilarating one, a life-changing and transforming one. A couple of things we want to share with you and want you to be able to stay alert with us and up to date and up to speed with what's going on with us. I'm encouraging every visitor and every FCC family member that has not done this to get uh, on our daily inspirational text message system, I want you to pull out your cell phone, RETNE, R-E-T-N-E-H, that's RETNE, amen, that's a real time, uh, pull out your cell phone right now and text four word, the number four, W-O-R-D, to the number 80123, we want to stay in touch with you, we want to stay connected with you, whatever our ministry is doing, we want to be able to send out a message to you, some kind of alert to let you know what's happening uh, in our neck of the woods. If we'll be preaching somewhere close to where you live, we love for you to come be a part of it. Uh, we're starting back our Teen Tuesday on Tuesday nights for all of our teens, so we want you to come and uh, be a part of that by way of telephone. Uh, we have Thursday uh, nights. Ask the pastor where you can 
email questions, call in and ask questions about life, about church, about the Bible, about relationships, about anything. Uh, these are just some of the ministry opportunities that we offer to you. Uh, I think this coming Friday night, our singles are going to shut down Brookwood Mall uh, Friday night at 630 at the food court. Anybody that's single, come on out and be a part of that, man. So many great and wonderful things going on uh, all week long. And we want you to stay up to speed with what's happening here at FCC. So definitely download that. And if uh, you're already in the downloading habit right now, go ahead and go to your Google Play, iTunes Store, uh, Apple Store, uh, and download the Forward Christian Center app. Just type in Forward Christian Center, F-O-R-W-O-R-D. It's spelled for word, but we just pronounce it as forward, forward Christian Center. But uh, download that app. You can get all of our sermons, and there's a couple of promos and things on there, ways to give. We just want you to stay up to speed with us with what God is doing here uh, at FCC. We don't want us to be too close to the mirror until we can't really see uh, that God has already blessed us. Uh, in a very major and mighty way. So again, we're so glad you're here with us. We hope that you've signed our guest book. Uh, and if at any time you would like to be a part of our church family, you can do that at any given moment. Do you know that you can become a part of this ministry right there on your cell phone, on your app? All you have to do is go to the connect section and fill that out uh, with your keypad. And you can uh, become a part of our ministry just like that. So you ain't got to come to the front and do all of that stuff. When Jesus says, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. And so we're not going to delay your coming uh, at all. The doors of the church are literally open 24-7. If you give your life to Jesus Christ at 2 a.m. on a Tuesday morning and say, I want to connect with the ministry, you can let us know right then and there. And we'll have access to your information. Is that not absolutely amazing? Amen. Amen. Go and give the Lord a hand of praise for that. What a great God we serve. What a great God we serve. I'm very excited about today, very excited about what God is getting ready to do uh, in all of our lives. Amen. Acts chapter number nine. Acts chapter number 9, and I will lift up to you in your reading, in your hearing rather, a single verse, verse number 27. Actually, I'll read verse 26 and 27 for the sake of context from the book of Acts chapter number 9, verses 26 and 27. Since some of you are standing, we'll ask that you go ahead and do that. If you would like to remain seated, that's cool in the game as well. If you don't have a Bible, look on with someone. And if the person next to you does not have a Bible, find you some new friends. Amen. I have determined that I don't even take advice from people who don't read their Bibles. Amen. But if you don't have one, download the app. There is a free Bible right there for you, King James Version and New Living Translation. But anyway, you get the word. I don't care how you get it. Just get it if you can. Acts chapter 9, verses 26 and 27. Please allow that worshiper to enter. Please never shut the door. Always keep the door open, please. Thank you. This is the word, so we need to get that. Acts chapter 9, verse 26 and 27. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of Almighty God. For those of you who have been with us for some time, and uh, by now you know that we are in a series that we've been in for the past several weeks entitled The Overlooked. Uh, each week we're either dealing with a book or a particular Bible character that is oftentimes overlooked. Today, the person that we want to take a moment to zoom in on, on his life is a brother by the name of Barnabas. Amen. Let the church say Barnabas. 
I, I want to introduce to some and present to other this real cool down to earth brother by the name of Barnabas. Uh, the series The Overlooked is really a series that is designed to get us to focus in on not so much who and or what overlooks us, but rather to focus in on the things that we have a tendency to overlook. Again, I stress to you that you will never miss out on a blessing because someone has chosen to overlook you. I think that's many of our claim to fame regarding why it is that we've not progressed and haven't been promoted in different areas of our life because people don't recognize my difference. They don't understand my significance and so we are frustrated and disappointed because we have all these gifts and nobody recognizes them. All this love to give and nobody to receive it. But if you are the gifted and someone overlooks your gift, you don't miss out on the blessing. The person who has overlooked you misses out on the blessing that you are. So never be frustrated that people overlook you. Rather, they should be frustrated if they have a tendency or a proclivity to do such a thing. And so we have decided not to go through the back door, but really to come in through the front door, to look at the front side of the matter and ask ourselves, what is it that I'm not paying attention to? What is it that I don't see the value and the significance of? What am I calling minute that God is calling major? What am I calling petty that God is calling prestigious? Something like that has happened even in this book of Acts chapter number nine as we zoom in on this brother by the name of Barnabas. The first thing for those of you who are Bible study students, if you're taking note, the first thing that is critically imperative for you to note is that Barnabas is not his real name. But Barnabas is not his real name. It, it was the name that was given to him, but it is not the name that he was born with. As a matter of fact, if you would go to the book of Acts chapter 4 in verses 36 and 37, and I'm paraphrasing, and you can read it in your spare time just to make sure that I'm not telling you anything that is not in the word. Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and verse 37 will point out to you that Joseph, whose surname was Barnabas, his surname was Barnabas, which literally means, get this, son of consolation. Son of consolation, which actually suggests that his name means son of encouragement. Encouragement. Let the church say encouragement. His name was given unto him because he did something that was encouraging. And you will note that when you read Acts chapter 4, verse 36 and 37, that he was given the name Barnabas after he did something that was crazy, off the wall, and outlandish. Can I tell you what this brother did? This brother took everything he had, his house, his cars, his possessions, everything he had, sold all his stuff and the proceeds from everything he sold he came into the temple found the preachers and dropped all the money at their feet look at your name and tell them we don't do that stuff in 2017 we, we, no lord I, mm -mm. I, we have a hard enough time giving God a dime out of every dollar I know can I get a what what from three people? I had to borrow a PMJ statement on that one right there. I'm sorry. We don't, we don't do that kind of stuff, baby. Some of us have a hard enough time trying to figure out if text to give is of God. We know we ain't trying to drop nothing. <laughs> we know we ain't trying to drop nothing at the feet of no preacher. After all, they doing better than I'm doing. I ain't finna give nothing to no preacher. The devil is a lie. Isn't it funny that some of the stuff we do at church ain't the stuff they did in the Bible? And some of the things that we refuse to do in church are really the things that they did do in the Bible. That, that's not the story that I came to tell you, but I did come to tell you that when he performed this act, he was then labeled as the son 
of encouragement, which means that what he did was encouraging. Let me bust somebody's bubble real quick, but I promise you that I'm going to sew you back together as I perform this surgery. That encouragement is more than just saying nice things to nice people. Encouragement is more than your words, it's your actions. It's what you do that becomes encouraging. It is an act that you perform. It is a will and intention of your heart that you really put into practice. It is something that you put into reality. And here's what encouragement really does. Write this down. Put it in your notes and definitely put it in your spirit. Encouragement at the core root, the result of encouragement is to make it easier for somebody else to do their job. That's what encouragement really is. It makes it easier for somebody else to do the thing that they've been called to do. That's, that's really all encouragement is. For him to sell all of his worldly possessions and then to come and not keep any of the proceeds to himself. And I know that to be true. I know that he, can keep, he didn't keep any of it for himself. How do you know that? Because Ananias and Sapphira came to the altar and dropped what they left on the altar. And the apostle said, is this all? Imagine a preacher seeing you putting some in and say, is this all? <laughs> You'd be ready to slap them off the stage. But he said, is this all? And they said, yes, this is all. And then I believe it's Peter that looks at her and said, you didn't lie to the Holy Ghost. You didn't kept some from yourself. And because they lied to the Holy Spirit, they lied and died right there at the altar. One died first, the spouse came later, told the same lie. And here it is, both of them dead at the altar because they lied about their giving. Whatever you do, don't lie to God about your giving. If you give, go ahead and give. If you ain't gonna give, don't give, but don't lie about what it is that you give, all right? And so as a result of what he did, it was so encouraging that they now called him a son of encouragement. C can I tell you something very very dynamic as we watch the dynamic of this whole situation is that there is always an expectation of obligation but there needs to be an expectation of motivation here's what I'm saying encouragement is so critical to the point that if you don't do it you will soon find out why people don't want to bless you I wish I was talking to, to, to a group of married people. I would say this to all the married people in the place. I would say this to all the people that's getting ready to get married. I would say this to all the married people. And I wouldn't even care what you thought about me. I have to be bold. I, I got to bring my gangster out for just a moment when I say this. I got to say this. I got to say this. For, for, all, for all the women, and I'm coming to the brothers too, but for all the women who mad at your husband because he ain't a good husband, is the reason he ain't a good husband because you don't help him be one? It is the reason is the reason he don't take care of you the way you want to be taken care of is because there is nothing about you that makes him want to do that predicated upon your previous actions. I'm just asking a question. Don't get mad at me. I'm just asking questions. You, you got to answer it when you get back home. Don't get in the car and have a fight over Pastor White. I'm just saying... <laughs> Is the reason he is not good. Have you have you ever wondered? Have you ever wondered the people that want to be loved, but you ain't helping nobody love you because you got a nasty attitude? You, you got all of these issues. You got all of these mistrust issues going on in your life, and you making it hard for people to do the stuff that you want. Is it possible, bro, that the reason she don't respect you is because you ain't respectful yourself? Is it, re is, is it a reason that, that the reason that she don't ever want to give you no fellowship is because you nasty? Yeah. All I'm saying is whatever it is that you expect, you need to inspect. Can I get a witness from three people? 
in this room. There is an expectation of obligation, but there should also be an expectation of motivation. All I'm saying is, if this is what you want from me, make it easy for me to give to you what you are asking of me through the element of encouragement. Who in this room feel me? Because I'm looking at some people right now, you work on a job that they expect a whole lot out of you, but they don't encourage you with things like a raise. They don't encourage you with things like a thank you card. The least you can do is come by and say, I thank you for working this extra overtime. I, I know we don't have the extra money to pay you, but I want to let you know that at least I do see you. You ought to high five your neighbor and tell them everybody needs encouragement. I, 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 yeah, I don't care how gifted you are. I don't care how anointed, how talented you are. I don't care how much money you have. Even folks that's got a lot still want to hear Merry Christmas at least. I, I mean, you expect everybody to give you a gift to at least say Merry Christmas to somebody. At least tell them please and thank you because encouragement says that I make it easier for you to do what it is that you have to do. And might I suggest to you that if you can't help nobody, get out the way. That's all I'm saying. That's that's real simple. I, as a matter of fact, I know that's borderline petty. That's that's borderline kindergartenish right there. If you can't help nobody, then just get out of the way. Your your grandmama tried to tell you that 20 years ago. If you ain't got nothing nice to say, oh y'all can help me preach this sermon. Who want the microphone? If you ain't got nothing nice to say, just don't say nothing. At all, the kindest word is an unkind word unsaid. Sometimes the best thing you can do is just zip your lip and close your mouth. If you ain't doing nothing to contribute to the cause, don't nobody want your two cents. Can I get a witness from three people up in here? You ever met somebody that's always got something to say about what you doing and they ain't never put forth no, no foot or an effort to try to help you get to where it is that you are going? Encouragers make it easy easy on people to do their jobs and you wonder why they don't want to take you to the next level because you come into the job complaining every day. You ain't making it easier for nobody. You just trying to make it easy for yourself. The way I feel, no, you only thinking about yourself with your selfish spirit of entitlement having self. The devil is a lie. Encouragement makes it easier for somebody else to do. At, at the end of the day, ultimately, here's what it does. Encouragement takes responsibility off of you, but it doesn't take authority away from you. That's what's encouraging. That's what's encouraging. And some of you, and I want to tip my hat off to you, because the, the, the role you play in life to your family, to your friends, on your job, in your church, in your schools, in your communities. So some of you, um, they have misquoted the text that says, to whom much is given, much is required. What I have ultimately found out, preachers, and this is so critical, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's so critical that you, you don't even really need to be entering into a ministry without this mindset that oftentimes when we say to whom much is given, much is required, what they really mean to whom much is given, all is required. All is required. All is required. This is why I want to tip my hat to you because some of you, you've been doing some things and you've been doing it without encouragement. I'm talking about those of you that don't nobody ever pick up the phone and ask how you doing. They got a lot of requests of you, but they ain't never said, well, before I ask you for anything, let me see how are you doing today. The people that just start talking don't even say good morning to you. I'm talking about the people that just walk by and say, can you and will you? I got two witnesses on the right side. I see. They just have so many requests of you, but they don't ever take the time to see how is your day going? Is there anything that you need? Are you eating? How is your family? What's, what's going on in your world? Some people, all they know is what it is that they want, which is why, this is very simple, but there are no substitutes for encouragers. No substitute for them. Nobody can replace an encourager because it's not so much what they say, it's what they do to make your load a little heavy. Let me say this to you, sister. Any man that's trying to talk to you and get your number, and he see you got a bag full of groceries and don't offer to grab one of them, don't you give him your number. 
The devil is a liar. Who do you think you are? Yeah, you, you have no sense of encouragement. That means you got some expectations of me, but you have no motivation to give me. This is what Barnabas did when he performed this act in Acts chapter 4. The act that he performed caused the apostles to become encouraged because it says that what they are doing is significant. If you are willing to sow like that, then that means that you see some significance in the cause of what it is that we are doing, which now says, you make me want to run on a little further. And every now and then, and I pray before the end of 2017 is over, I pray that God will put you in the path of somebody who makes you want to keep doing what you're doing. Who am I preaching to in this room? Who, who makes you want to keep doing what you're doing? I, I'm talking about the kind of place that you're glad to be there because people help you do what it is that you've been called to do, which is why five chapters later, in Acts chapter 9, Barnabas is so critical to the experience of a brother we all know by the name of Paul. P Paul is critical to New Testament theology. Two-thirds of the New Testament were written by this brother. I mean, the greatest apostle to ever do it. I mean, the boy was bad. Ain't no sense in hating on Paul. Paul was the dude. I'm telling you, Paul, Paul spoke uh, at least six different languages. I'm telling you, this brother was smart. He was astute. He was he was very profound. He was a deep brother. I mean, he could go any place and talk to anybody. I'm talking about the same dude that could come over here and hang with the bros and, and dab them up. The same dude that could come over here and talk to the street thugs and to the gangsters and to the homies and little nook nook and little pistol starter was the same guy that could come over here and speak to the king and speak to the queen and not even miss a beat. He was well balanced on both sides of the coin. He was multifaceted and some of you in this room, the reason that God has so blessed you is because he has allowed for you to balance the beam on both sides. Yeah, so, some people try to say that you're a traitor and that you really don't know what it is that you're doing or what it is that you want to do. No, it ain't that I don't know who I am. It's just that I know how to go over here and still fit in and go over there and still get my job done. Yeah, just because just because of the color of my skin, it don't mean that my first language is Ebonics. I know how to speak correctly. I know how to pronunciate and enunciate my words. Just because I use correct English, it don't mean I'm trying to act white. It means that I know that on this end, if I want to achieve that, then I got to go through this. But it does not diminish the fact that I'm still a brother just like you. Who am I preaching to in this room? That's the reason some people hate you right now. It's because you know how to get in and fit in wherever it is that you go. You, you the kind of person that you can play all five positions on the basketball court. It, it really don't make you no different. You the kind of person that you can walk up in a job site. I guarantee you it, the, the next interview you have, if you tell them folks what I'm finna tell you right now, I promise you they gonna hire you. If they don't hire you, you call me right then and there. Don't even leave them folks office until you pick up the phone and say, hold up, let me call my pastor right now. I need to talk to whoever it is that is hiring you. I don't care. This question ain't even got to be on the application. They, if they don't ask you this question, answer it anyway, alright? They say the least you say is the best. The devil is like, you say this to, say this to them. I promise you they're going to hire you. When you go up in there, you tell them put me in any position in this building. I can work with anybody you put around me. I promise you they're going to hire you because in every place it's always I don't want to work over there and I don't like them like that. And, oh, they crazy over there. I don't want to be on number three. I want to work on the fourth floor. But when you walk in, you can say you put me on three, you put me on four, or you put me on eight. It don't make me no difference. Wherever I go, I change the game. Wherever I go, I change the atmosphere. Wherever I go, when I touch it, it's going to turn to gold. As a matter of fact, if you don't want it to be better, don't invite me to be a part of it because everywhere I go, I'm the life of the party. Y'all ain't talking to your boy up in here. Whatever I do, it's going to be in grand style. You ought to high five three people and tell them he's talking about me right now. 
That's why anybody that marry you, they gonna get a real good treat. Anybody that hire you, they gonna have the best employee they ever had. Cause wherever I go, I make it better for everybody else that is around me. Acts chapter nine is critical for this brother by the name of Paul that we knew him as Saul because in his Saul days, in his heyday, he was a terrorist. This brother was some serious. You think you think y'all was scared of Bin Laden, man? Look, <laughs> Saul of Tarsus was some. Si this brother right here was so deep that he would bind Christians, arrest them, put them in chains, and had no problem watching them die. He was the kind of dude that if you said something to him, he would tell you, like Frank Lucas, an American gangster. So what you want to do? Because I'm telling you, it don't mean nothing to me for you to show up here tomorrow with your head blown off. Saul was one of them kind of brothers. It don't make me no difference. Would you rather it be your house blow up next time? Because the first time I just blew up your car, but would you rather it be your house that I blow up the next time? It don't, it don't make me no difference. You, you trying to tell me about normal? Normal is watching the police come to my house and pull my 12-year-old cousin outside and putting him up against a tree and putting a shotgun down his throat and blowing his head off. I wasn't caring about no police then. I don't care about no police now. That was Saul of Tarsus mentality. Straight up thug, one scared of nothing. Didn't make him no difference what you had to say. He was the kind of person that said that if you said to him, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you out. I'm gonna kill you. He said, "I take your whole family out." He was that kind of dude. I'm talking about ruthless. Some of y'all looking at me like you, you, you came from the hood I came from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, some of y'all got that mentality yourself right now. I'm still praying for you with your, with your hard self. I'm still praying for you. It's gonna be all right. You know, it's okay. It's okay. We gonna, we gonna balance that out with your salvation. It's okay. We gonna be meek, humble, and mild. We gonna be saved but not soft. I get that, but. Saul was off the chain, complete terrorist. As a matter of fact, y'all remember Stephen, the first deacon of the church? Y'all remember he got stoned to death? Guess who was over in the corner holding everybody jackets? Yeah, this preacher that we talking about. Can, can I tell you the reason that some of y'all will not really be able to excel in your next season is because people won't let you forget who you were when you were Saul. It was Saul over here saying, look, you look like you're having a hard time throwing that rock, so give me your coat. I'm going to hold it so you can get better leverage so you can throw that rock and kill people. You see, some of y'all, you think you think you're not guilty because you ain't throwing no rocks, but if you're holding the jacket of the people that's throwing the rocks, you're just as guilty. Uh, some of y'all ain't saying them, but you show sure listening to folks that's saying stuff, and, and you nodding your head and shaking your head. You're just as guilty. It was this Saul that all of a sudden on the Damascus road has a life-changing experience. He says a light shone from heaven. He fell off his beast. He heard the voice of Jesus say, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? I know you seen you kicking against the pricks. I know you think you tough out here in these streets, but I'm the CEO of the universe. I can speak and a man die. But my same words can speak in the same man that died can get up and live again. Don't you think you can? Your arms are too short <laughs> to fight against me, Paul. That, that's why some of y'all worried about some folk that won't do right. The reason they ain't changing is because you think you can change them. But all you got to do is put God on people. <laughs> Once you put God, you put, put God on people. I don't, you don't sit around fighting against people. The, the worst thing you can do is drive a Christian to their knees because if I ever get on my knees and start talking to God about it, he will hear. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. He will hear my faintest cry and answer by and by. And this is what happens to Saul, and his life is totally, completely transformed in one day. Blinded for three days, and Ananias comes, prays for him, and he receives his sight, not just his physical sight, but his spiritual sight. And in verse number 26 of Acts chapter 9, since we read it, we might as well deal with it. The Bible says he had a saved. He said he was going to join himself 
with the other disciples, but the other disciples didn't really want him coming to their church because they was all scared of him. Can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? Please don't, please don't get mad when I say this. I say stuff because I love you, but ain't nothing worse than a chicken Christian. <laughs> ain't nothing worse than a scared saint. Just, Lord, just, we don't want Saul to come in here because we know his background. We know his reputation. So you got all these disciples and one person and everybody scared of one? Look, 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 look. I understand if it's one-on-one -on -one and you know you can't beat them, but you, 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 uh, I had this little situation one time when I was going to Arrington Middle School and um, I walked to school because I ain't stay but right down the street from it. And so um, I'm walking to school. I'm by myself this day, J. Will. I'm by myself. I see these dudes coming up the track like where 24th Street is. And so I'm thinking real fast, like, okay, they around my age. They supposed to be in school too. But they coming up. And they yelled out, hey, what school you go to? I knew Jones Valley and Arrington had a rivalry going on, so I said, <coughs> I go to Green Acres. <laughs> Shh, don't tell nobody. I was in the seventh grade. I was a little nervous. I ain't going to lie. My bad. Bump y'all, all right? If you felt like you was in trouble, you lie to get yourself out of there, too. I said, I'll go on to Green Acres. But, you know, then they thought about it. They said, hold up. Green Acres the other way. <laughs> so they start running towards me. I took off. I'm gone. I mean, I was running like Michael Johnson through there. Where, where Greater Shiloh is now, that used to be nothing but grass, but I knew the little pathway, so I'm running. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. I'm running. I finally get up there. Get up there. They had done stopped or whatever. So the next day, walking to school, uh, Auntie Rollin don't know about this, but I called Roderick. <laughs> Roderick's my cousin, y'all. Called him, had a couple of my friends, you know, walk to school. And so, lo and behold, I'm walking by myself. I'm coming this way toward the track. My cousin is coming from this direction toward the track, so they don't even see him. I'm going up toward the track, and then they said something. Hey, you go to Arrington. You that same dude from yesterday. This time I ain't take off running because as soon as I said that, here come my cousin step around there. <laughs> my cousin said a little something, something to him. And I'm like, yeah. Come on over here now. What? What? Come on. Yeah. Oh, hold me back. Yeah. Yeah. Come. I wish you would come over here today. You see, when I was by myself, I ain't had nothing to say. But when I had me some positive reinforcement, come on down here if you want to. The reason some of y'all been getting punked is because you've been going through some stuff by yourself. But when you got somebody with you, when you got somebody supporting you, when you got somebody holding you up on every lean inside, won't some strength come up on the inside of you? Lean on your neighbor and tell them every Everybody needs some encouragement. Everybody needs some help. Everybody needs some support sometimes. See, by myself, that was fear because it was one against three. But when I had somebody else with me, it lets me know I ain't got to be scared no more. But check it. Everybody was scared of one dude. Everybody was scared of Saul. But then all of a sudden, get this. I ain't got but two points to this sermon. I'm finna be done right here. Here's the second point to this message. Verse 27. You gotta read verse 27. Every word matters. Even the verses that you think don't mean that mean something. Verse 27, it's in your Bible if you ain't tired out. It said this, but Barnabas took him. It was Barnabas. Paraphrase. It was Barnabas who took Saul into the presence of the others, which means this, that as long as Saul was going on his own, they wouldn't receive him. But because Barnabas took him, the friction eased up. I'm going to say something to you, and please hear me. Please hear me. Look at me. Please hear me. 
you are not going to the next season of your life until someone who is credible makes you eligible. You ain't going there by yourself. God would not have it that way because he will never allow you to say I did it on my own. So, okay, you need more scripture for that. Even Jesus do you know when Jesus became significant to the people around him? The Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. Do you know when Jesus became credible? It was when John the Baptist was standing in the middle of the Jordan River, saw Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Wasn't nobody studying Jesus until John the Baptist, who was the pastor of that region that everybody looked up to, when this man said, I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie this man's shoelaces, that's when everybody turned their head toward Jesus. Because somebody on that level had to introduce Jesus before he could come on that level. And some of you think that you're getting ready to go up there, but you ain't going up there until somebody with some authority and some influence stands next to you, places their hand on your shoulder and say, this person, all right. All right, y'all, okay, okay, all right, all right, all right. Y'all don't know how to shout good, so let me help you right here. Uh, watch this. Don't wait on somebody to come put their hand on your shoulder. I'm saying to you, you are the person who needs to help somebody else become. You see, the reason some of us can't go nowhere is because we get all we can and we can all we get. But you know you are important when you can look in somebody else and see the greatness in somebody else. And when you see them trying to make it instead of you standing in front of them so that they won't become bigger and better than you, the best thing you can do is help create a legacy by introducing somebody to their next season. Because if somebody had to do it for Jesus, somebody going to have to do it for you. But stop letting everybody bless you and you don't ever want to bless nobody. Who am I? Pre Can't you? Ooh, don't it make you mad? All them folks that's always got their hand out saying, give me, give me, give me, give me, please, give me, give me, give me. And as soon as the table will turn, they don't ever want to do nothing to sow or invest in anybody else's life. But the reason that encouragers are so important, write this down, is because encouragers are influential. They are the most influential people on the planet. Why is that? Because encouragers... Don't just encourage, they are encouragers, which means it is a lifestyle. What the church needs are people who don't do things as events, but do them as lifestyles. Let's see, all right. I don't worship, I am a worshiper. I don't just preach. That's what I do. I'm a preacher. It's who I am. I don't just pray. I'm a prayer. It's who I am. All right. Uh, I was talking to Dion one day. He said, I, I feel you on that because I mentioned that one time. He said, see, to me, I don't just play drums. I am a drummer. It's who I am. It's in my blood. It's in my bones. It's, it's what I do. It's, it's my makeup. It's, it, it, it's a part of me. It's in my essence. I, I, I could be asleep and still do it because it's who I am. What the world needs, what the church needs, what God needs is not just people who do things as an event, but he needs somebody that can walk and say, this is my lifestyle. This, this ain't just what I do on Sunday morning. You see, the reason some folk got you twisted is because they think that what they see you doing on Sunday Sunday is just what you do on Sunday. The devil is a lie. Look at somebody and tell them, I live like this every day. 
No, who do you think you are that I got to come in here and impress you? You don't give me enough money for me to have to impress you. You, you don't pay enough of my bills for me to have to impress you. What you see is what you get. I, I don't just act like this to get accolades of people. When I say good morning to people, I mean that. I, I don't go alone to get along. If I don't like you, you gonna know I don't like you. But if I love you, I love you from now until eternity. I don't care what nobody say about you. I don't care who don't like like you if I like you I like if you my dog you my dog if you my nizzle then you are my nizzle for shizzle it don't matter what nobody else got to say what nobody else got to do who I am is who I am and if you don't like it take it up with my manufacturer I'm gonna be who God has called me to be come hell I want it He's an encourager. It's what he does. It's who he is. So he ain't saying nothing bad about nobody. He's giving everybody a chance and opportunity. As a matter of fact, Kendall, I found out why. I found out why later on in the book of Acts that Paul and Barnabas fell out with each other. I mean, they had a big, bad falling out with each other. And the reason they fell out is because they went on one missionary journey and they had this dude by the name of John Mark with them. But then they turned around and looked and John Mark wasn't nowhere to be found. He just abandoned them. He didn't call. He didn't say nothing. He just up and abandoned them while they were in the midst of a missionary journey. When they got back and they planned to go on the next missionary journey, Barnabas was like, okay, well, we're going to call John Mark so he can roll with us. Paul said, the devil is a lie. We ain't asking him to roll nowhere with us. You see, I don't know how you do this thing, but I need somebody with me that can take a licking and keep on ticking. I, I don't need nobody rolling with me that I got to look over my shoulder every five minutes to wonder if you still going to be there. So if you want to roll with him, you can go and roll with him, but he is not going with me. He can't be my armor bearer. He cannot carry my armor because he the only person watching. He wants to be my salsa for the wrong reason. You see, some people think that it's the job of the saucer to only catch the spillage, but that is not the only job of a saucer. Not only does a saucer catch the spillage of that which is in the cup, but the saucer has the responsibility of supporting and holding the cup in its proper place. You see, there are a whole lot of people that won't show overflow, but they don't want to help keep you supported. They don't want to help keep you grounded. They are the person that help keep you from falling. This is the person that protects you and loves you and have your back. They don't just love you, but they look out for you. You understand? He said, no, he want to catch my overflow, but he don't want to catch me. So I don't need nobody rolling with me that will not catch me if I fall. I am so sick and tired of fake, fickle, and phony people that say this little crazy stuff like, I'm with you when you right. I don't need you when I'm right. I need to know that when I'm wrong and I will be wrong because I'm a human being. I will make mistakes, but can you still stand in agreement with me even when you don't agree with Oh, I wish I could preach to somebody that was spiritual in this room. And so he says, John Mark cannot roll, but because Barnabas is such an encourager, he ain't got nothing bad to say about nobody. Watch what Barnabas said. He said, okay, I'll let John Mark roll with me. I, I let him roll with me. I'm going to see the best in him. Maybe he made a mistake the last time, but this time he's probably going to do a better job. That's what encouragers do because encouragers are in flu, in chew, which literally means, check it, I'm done. We're getting ready to roll right here. He says, listen, if he says he's good, Ah, God help me in here. He, he's good. He, watch what he does. He says, he took him before the other disciples and then without making Paul give his own testimony, Barnabas started giving him his testimony for him. It's in verse number 27. If you ain't tired out of your Bible, I'm exegetical in my approach. I need my Bible to preach. So watch what he says. He says he met Jesus in the way. He spoke to him as well. He good to go, y'all. You ain't got to be afraid to receive him. And check this. If it's any thing that's going to happen with him, basically what he says is, since I'm bringing him, you can charge it to my account. But I trust the change in his life. I trust the deliverance in his life because to top it all off, 
Here's the last part of verse 27. He preached in Damascus in the name of Jesus. Okay, y'all don't know when to shout, so let me see if I can help you. You got to remember, where was Paul when he was headed to bind Christians? He was on the road to Damascus. That means he was going to that place to kill Christians. He was going to that place to destroy Christians. But the same place that he was going to do the work of the enemy became the same place he stopped off to do the work of the Lord. Here's what I'm trying trying to tell you is that's why you got to be careful of casting people aside too quickly because the same person that created destruction was the same person that helped to bring some salvation and because he preached Jesus in the same place that he was coming to destroy we ain't got no choice but to receive him here's what I need to close with and drop this in your spirit here's why Barnabas was so important to Saul's life because if Barnabas had not brought him in the council of the other disciples and apostles he never would have been able to be as great as he was to New Testament theology. And some of you in this room, you need to go home today and sit down and write a thank you letter for all the people that help you to get to where it is that you are right now. I know you don't want to say too much about it because you want everybody to think that you made it this far on your own. But who can be honest and admit that there were days that you forgot to pray for yourself? You need to thank God for everybody that was praying. Somebody pray for me. They had me on their mind. They took the time and prayed for me and I'm so glad that they prayed for me because while I was out here being crazy, somebody else was being Christian. When I was out here bawling out and wilding out, I had somebody that was worshiping, going down on their hands and on their knees and on their face saying, Father, I stretch my hands to thee. God, if you don't do nothing else, save my crazy child. If you don't do nothing else, save my grandbaby. While they're out there doing everything under the sun, keep them safe and keep them protected. Throw a shield of protection all around them from the crown of their head to the sole of their feet. Every time they go to sleep, dispatch your angels to keep charge and watch over them all night long. While the blood is still running warm in their veins, give them another chance so that surely goodness and mercy should follow them all the days of their life. You ought to high five your neighbor and tell them I thank God for encouragement. As a matter of fact, I don't know. You might be holding back some encouragement. Maybe you need to let me know that it's going to be all right. For everybody that's in this room, if you've ever been broke before, but God came through for you, you need to testify to somebody else and let them know right now that whatever you're going through, God will bring you out of it. It ain't no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do the same for you. Anybody in here, you ever been sick before? You didn't even know if you was going to live to see another day? You need to encourage somebody right now that if you're on your bed of affliction, God will reach way down and pick you up again. Anybody in here ever been sad or depressed before? Can you look down your row and let them know that God will put a smile on your face? Any, anybody ever been down before? You ought to let your neighbor know that Jesus will pick you up if he has to reach way down. As a matter of fact, do me a favor. If it's somebody around you that's still sitting in their seat, I want you to grab them by their hand and pull them up on their feet and say no neighbors I'm picking you up cause that's what he did for me and since he did it for me I gotta do it for you since God been good to me I gotta be good to you since God forgave me I gotta forgive you since God lifted me I gotta lift you up I'm through when I tell you that it is no secret what our God can do if he did it for them he's gonna do it for you now slip your arms around your neck neighbor's shoulder and say neighbor whatever you're going through you can depend on the Lord to bring you through but neighbor that 
ain't all to it. You can depend on me to pray for you. Is there anybody here gonna be your brother's keeper? If you're in trouble, you can call on me. Cause if he did it for me, I'll do it for you. Give God a praise for your neighbor. Give God a praise for your church member. Give God a praise for your whole family. Won't he do it? If you know he will, throw your hand up. Throw your hand back. Shout out. Everybody needs some encouragement. And you need to be the one to give it. It's two type of people in every church. Two. Different faces, different skin colors, complexions, ain't but two type of people. People who need ministry and people who are ministry. You can always tell people who need ministry more than they are ministry because they always ask what the church gonna do. But when you are ministry, you ask, okay, what am I gonna do? God wants you to graduate from just needing it. To being it. I'm talking about, I, I remember um, family, um, the last time my grandfather went into the hospital, uh, they took him uh, in the back before they put him in a room. And um, I was honestly talking to a friend of mine on the phone that day and uh, I was watching my grandfather there and uh, I remember saying to my friend and I, I don't mind sharing this now at the time I wouldn't have said that um, just for the sake of the emotional stability in that moment but I said to my friend uh, I feel like this is the last time he's coming in like this I, I feel like this is the last time he's coming in like that so I'm sitting here and I watch my grandfather and while I'm in the room there with him, somebody passes by, recognizes me and beckons for me and says, um, they, they knew me from uh, somewhere and I really didn't uh, quite remember them too well, vaguely. And they said, my uh, brother is a couple of rooms down. Would you come and pray? So I'm here with my grandfather but somebody else wants me to leave from there and come pray for their brother and I thought about what I'm saying to you now that in as much as I needed encouragement I had to go be encouragement for somebody else so, so for, the, for a few moments, I went over there, talked to them, had prayer, and went back. And what I'm saying to you is don't get so caught up in what you need until you overlook the fact that somebody still needs you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This real talk, y'all. Some of y'all, you've been using work as an excuse. I work so much. That don't stop your grass from growing. Still got to cut it. I work so much, but when your kids cry, you still need to attend to them. My prayer is that while you're in the process of doing what you do, that while you are being Barnabas to somebody else, 
that God will send somebody to be Barnabas for you. Amen. You ought to throw up your hand and say, I receive that. I, 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 I receive that. I receive that. Some of y'all do too much for people and nobody does anything for you. But today I want to pray and reverse that curse. Because God knows that in order for you to be good for others, you got to be good yourself. I pray God will send you a Barnabas in your life. You don't need many. Just If you just get you one person that sees the burden and the heavy necessity that's on your life and says, I got you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray for every heavy laden person in this room, for every burdened individual that life has hit them in so many different directions. But God, you have yet been looking out for them and you've been having to do it personally yourself. But God put them in the path of someone who doesn't want anything from them, only wants to see them excel and do well. But God, while you're doing that, help us to simultaneously become the encouragement for somebody else. That when we see others struggling and hurt and down and depressed, we will for that moment not even think about ourselves. Because one of the experiences that I've had with you is that while praying for others, you are answering the silent prayer request of my heart. And I thank you, God. I don't know how you're going to do it. That ain't even my job to figure it out. But I thank you, God, that you're going to do it and move on behalf of your people today. Not because I'm such a great person, not because I have the greatest prayers, but I do have the greatest God, <laughs> the only wise God, the only true and living God who can do any and everything but fail. Bless your people today. Help them to become Barnabas as you send a Barnabas into their life. I give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, it is done. In Jesus' name. Come on, clap your hands if you receive that today. Hallelujah. He won't always.